Since 1948, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences has been the premier organization of forensic science professionals providing trustworthy, objective data that is relied upon by the judicial system, Congress, and the public. From the Sunshine State and the 75th Anniversary Conference of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, this is AAFS TV and we're here to highlight how science works. Hello and welcome to Orlando, Florida. I'm Andrea Godfrey and I'll be taking you through the next four days of fascinating forensic science content as more than 5,000 professionals all converge to celebrate 75 years of leading the progression of forensic science. Today, we will take a look back at just how far we've come in the last 75 years, discussing some of the greatest achievements with those at the forefront of forensic science. We also kick off our tour across the country of institutions and organizations blazing new trails in forensic research and development. There is so much to cover and we want to make sure you never miss a minute. You can always catch the latest episode of AAFS TV from our dedicated spot on the AAFS website homepage, on the in-house channel 137 here at the Shingle Creek Resort, and as always, you can see all of our interviews and clips on our YouTube and Twitter pages. We start things off on this first day with current AAFS president, Dr. Laura Fulginiti, and president-elect, Ken Williams. Thank you both for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having us. This is such an exciting year for all of us to be getting together, celebrating 75 years of AAFS. How far have we come? We have come really far. We started with a couple of hundred members in a small hotel in Chicago with only three sections represented. And today we have 12 sections ranging from anthropology to question documents and over 6,000 members. And the technology has also just exploded over these last 75 years. Yes, we have experienced so many advances in technology, which makes it possible for us to do our job much better and also much more efficiently. We look at some of the advances as it relates to the computer software. You know, it allows us to make distinctions between minute pieces of data as well as some of the advances as it relates to DNA, rapid DNA technology, which allows the development of a DNA profile in less than 90 minutes. And think about some of the smaller things like 3D printing, which also helps disciplines like anthropology. Where would we be without forensic science? So what a lot of people don't know is that forensic science is the underpinning of the science that is presented in the courtroom. This could be for civil trials or mostly for criminal trials. And in fact, having trustworthy data that people can rely on to make really life and death decisions is hugely important. Our entire justice system relies on yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah. And we just think about the definition of forensic science, the application of science to matters of the law. Forensic science really forms that nexus between the law and the science. And just think about that. Forensic science really relieves the burden on the prosecution and also aids the defense in criminal and civil investigations. Laura, you have mentioned here previously that science has been under attack, especially over the last several years. How do we combat that problem and prove to the general public that science does in fact work? One of the things that really frustrates me is that science deniers have pithy sayings that they can put out there. They're really catchy. They get stuck in your ear. You can't forget them. And I think that's what's wrong. Scientists, we need to come up with some of those bumper stickers or mugs, you know, to get people to recognize that science is really important and it can be relied upon. That's the most important thing. If you think about people making decisions about whether or not to get a COVID test or a COVID vaccine and their life depends on it, but they don't trust the science underlying it, that to me is a real disconnect. We need to fix that. And forensic science is facing that same problem. Ken, you're our incoming president here, so you have the next year ahead of you. Is that also a topic that you think you're, is going to be at the top of your mind? Well, science works, like our current president said, is that the underpinning. But my thing for the upcoming year is justice for all, which is also one of those overarching themes that we have to keep in mind as we do our job on a daily basis. Justice for all, not justice, not just justice for the alleged vic victim or the defendants, but justice for all. Laura, looking back um, over this last year as you've served as president, anything that sticks out to you, something you're most proud of? 
The thing that I'm the most proud of is the new status that we have, professional affiliate, where we've allowed individuals who are so play a supporting role to forensic science, who work at forensic science every single day. They are now welcome in the academy, and we are looking forward to the diversity that they're going to bring to us. A question for both of you. In your opinion, what do you think is the biggest obstacle, the biggest challenge for the forensic science community right now? Public perception. We really need people to understand that it's not Hollywood, it's nitty gritty, it is trustworthy, but it doesn't happen in 90 minutes or 60 minutes or 30 minutes. It this takes is not CSI. It is not CSI. It takes time, it takes meticulousness, and it takes the ability to translate the data into something understandable so that the courts can rely upon it. Ken, we started off talking about what all we've accomplished over these last 75 years. What are you looking forward to over the next 75 years? I'm looking forward to taking the momentum that we've started over the first 75 and just building upon that. Just doing even more, taking the academy to the next level because through that, we can also advance the entire forensic science community. If we want to take the lead in the forensic science community and build that reputation of the American Academy, we can look forward to the next 75 years. Well, best of luck for you next year, and thank you so thank much for you. all of your work this thank past you. year. Appreciate it. Thanks for your time today. And thank, thank you, you for much. having us. Forensic science is a unique applied science. It holds much potential to address and help mitigate biosocial inequities in both the living and the dead. This includes inequalities in health, structural violence and trauma, mortality and education. The Radford University Forensic Science Institute addresses these inequities on both levels. The Radford University Forensic Science Institute is a professional state-of-the-art Forensic Science Research Center and Working Laboratory associated with the Center for Sciences at Radford University. It also has an academic component and it's associated with the Department of Anthropological Sciences offering a forensic anthropology concentration and a forensic science minor that's interdisciplinary across campus. The main advantage of attending Radford University and participating in the Forensic Science Program is the opportunity to engage in research as an undergraduate student. These students here are involved in research from the beginning and therefore they have better skill sets to support law enforcement and others in their endeavors for investigation in a more sophisticated and professional manner. They get experience using very expensive, very good, very delicate, but very useful equipment. The career paths are many. That wasn't a big thing. I mean, it didn't occur to me that that was going to be the first forensic pathologist. I mean, there's certainly been other, you know, there was another woman who had been president, you know, early on. But it seemed like a lot of things we've done, it's just, you know, if you are not looking to, to be the first one, you just do what you're doing, you know? And I had really good mentors. I mean, the, the Dr. Weston I worked with, he, um, that was, that was why I went into forensic. He had just come to the University of New Mexico and he was very associated. He actually was a past president here. And so I just kind of fell into coming to these and realizing what an incredible training um, and experience it was and getting to meet people in the other section. The training you get by coming to these meetings and associating with all the other sections um, and what has happened, I think, is, is that um, all, all of these people have gotten together and made the, all of the sections and the and things they do, not just pathology, but all of those uh, much more credible and have the research behind them to show what does work and what isn't work and what things are um, appropriate to use as, as evidence and what things are not. I think that's been one of the biggest accomplishments is, is that what has happened as far as verifying all of the subspecialties. I think uh, one of the biggest issues in pathology and in forensic pathology is getting people in pathology interested in doing forensic. Um, once they get to it, a lot of them become really interested in me. Once I learned about forensic there was no way to go back to general pathology. <laughs> um, but the, the job is, is 
more difficult in some ways. I mean, you know, the hours are not the same. You have to be on call more than you do if you're a surgical pathologist. The pay is not nearly as good. It's, it's, it's a, often a state or a county budget. There may be politics involved. And um, you know, it's not just doing your job. Um, but so those things, I think, are getting better. I think they're getting better and better. But that's one of the problems with recruiting is it's pay and hours and the type of job. And not everybody is cut out to be in an autopsy room a lot. <laughs>《Investigation into Closed Cases and Collaboration with Local Law Enforcement, the Forensic Science Institute at California State University, Los Angeles, has been able to exonerate wrongfully convicted individuals and bring justice to the community that it serves. Let's take a tour. I was arrested in 1984. I was convicted in 1988. The sentence was overturned last year, 2022. It was a feeling of hopelessness at times. You, you feel a lot of despair. Then your mind tell you, well, this is it. You, you, you're probably going to die here. And the courts told me that all of the evidence was destroyed. We are dedicated to the highest professional, scientific, and academic standards in our service to our students, to the forensic science profession, and to the justice community at large. What Cal State LA has done through the Innocent Project, it really gave me my life back, and I appreciate that. And the, and the forensic program and all that, how that was very instrumental in testing the DNA to reveal the, my innocence in this matter. The goal of the Journal of Forensic Sciences is to advance forensic science research, education, and practice by publishing peer-reviewed manuscripts of the highest quality. Editor-in-Chief Mike Pete is here this morning to discuss. Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Let's start off with this. How do these publications strengthen the scientific foundation of forensic science? Uh, let me first introduce the Journal of Forensic Sciences to you, <laughs> okay. as that is an important vehicle for forensic scientists to publish their work, mm -hmm. whether they be researchers or practitioners. And that's a subtle difference between other scientific journals, in that we focus on both researchers and okay. practitioners, people who work in the forensic science labs right. and the people who work academically. Right. We get between uh, 800 and 1,000 submissions a year Okay. from these countries, so mm -hmm. it's a very well-recognized journal of, of forensic science. Absolutely, that's incredible. So how are these documents utilized um, in both legal and regulatory communities? I think there's probably four major audiences for them. Uh, when we look at the practitioner audience, they use them predominantly in courts, mm -hmm. when they testify in support of a criminal investigation or a death investigation or even a civil case they will turn to the journal and other journals uh, for support of their findings and their views. Uh, secondly, we get a lot of people who are researchers who use them for academic tenure. Okay. And the usual f way of getting academic tenure is to use an uh, article that's been published, mm -hmm. you've published, etc. And then we have the regulation audience, which increasingly has become the most popular or yeah. the most used because of the regulations that are being introduced, not just in the United States, but outside. Okay. And then we have the teachers, both the academic teachers and the, and the people who teach the crime lab partici uh, practitioners. And again, they use the journal as a background for that. What is the uh, main benefit, you would say, to members of the academy? The, the journal is multidisciplinary, just as the academy is. So we publish articles in all the 11 disciplines, very, you know, some are more prevalent than others. Mm -hmm. um, but so they have access to that work uh, at their fingertips, being a member of the academy, the journal is part of that membership. And I think that's probably the major benefit for the academy members mm -hmm. with regard to the journal. You know, you've been editor in chief here for a little bit, a couple of years, 23 years as editor-in-chief of the journal. Is there anything that sticks out to you as far as maybe a proudest moment, major accomplishment? I think, um, I think 
the transitions of, in the uh, publishing work okay. and dealing with those. Uh, they've changed from paper, believe it or not. When I took over, it was paper. <laughs> you actually printed out uh, a printed journal. Out, we printed out a <laughs> journal. We printed out all the papers. Um, and that transition to completely electronic and the ability that's led for all journals to be global. Well, obviously, you're doing a wonderful job. Well, thank you. Because you've been at the helm for quite a while now. So thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. Utilizing the listen, learn, and inform model is what Nancy Levine, the new director at the National Institute of Justice, says will be key in implementing the forensic science strategic plan. We sat down with Levine, fresh into her new role, to discuss how she plans to help you achieve your goals. Director Levine, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's my pleasure to be here. Let's start off with where you see some of the major challenges are for the forensic science community. One of the biggest challenges is around the forensic infrastructure at the state and local level. Hmm. And we know that forensics labs, coroner's offices, medical examiner's offices are really cash strapped and staff spare. Mm -hmm. They don't have the resources to do the basic work, much less to conduct research on their own. Hmm. Now, we in the federal government support that research to some extent, but the states really need to step up. And so that's one area where we'd like to see more support for research and forensics on the ground. Another area that I'm very interested in, it goes beyond forensics. It's what I'm calling evidence to action. And it's a key priority for me as NIJ director because I wanna support not just the translation of research so it's understandable to the people we're trying to reach, mm. but also making sure that they don't just understand the evidence, but are inspired to make changes because of it. In the forensic space, that's called transition. So how do we ensure that new technological developments in the forensic space are transitioned to practice on the ground? As you mentioned earlier, you have just newly become the director here at NIJ. Congratulations on this role. What would you like to see happen in your first year? Well, I got lucky because I started, I think, in June of last year and already on my desk awaiting my approval was a forensic strategic plan. Um, so forensic science strategic plan, uh, which can be found online, and has done a fantastic job of calling the needs of the field and ensuring that our investments in research and technology development meet those needs. And the way we do that is through what we call the listen, learn, and inform model. So key to the development of that plan is hearing from AAFS members and others in the field, practitioners that often volunteer their time to help us identify what are their pain points, what are areas where they need more support, more knowledge, more technology, more efficiency, and to help fill those gaps. And that's what we've done with the strategic plan. And that's something that I'm looking forward to seeing us implement and make good on. Another way to meet the needs of the field, and this is related to our forensic science strategic plan, is recognizing the needs of the workforce. And we're well aware that there are recruitment and retention issues in mm -hmm. the discipline. And also a lack of diversity. We'd like to see a lot more diversity. And so part of our strategic plan is to also use our graduate research fellowship program, which is a program that supports dissertation research um, across the spectrum of science and engineering, and that can help support emerging scholars, including scholars of color. We also are looking in the coming year to support minority serving institutions mm -hmm. to level the playing field and make them more competitive in seeking and winning research grants from NIJ. You mentioned that strategic plan. What role, if any, does AAFS have in that strategic plan? What's really important is reaching out to the field and learning from them. Mm -hmm. And AAFS has been really generous in making time for us, allowing us to host a complimentary symposium so that we can share what's new in the technology space and hear from its members during the annual conference. Um, supporting the publication of research in its journal, and a lot of other ways. And so we hope to continue that close collaboration over time. What would you envision, or I maybe say hope, is on the horizon for the future of forensic science? There are so many areas of opportunity to build new knowledge. 
Um, one area is in marijuana detection. So there's a lot of challenges around, is it hemp, is it marijuana? As well as importantly, marijuana impairment among motor motorists particularly. We also need to invest in next-gen sequencing. We need to invest in more of those studies around the validation and value of the various pattern analysis disciplines. Uh, we need more research and analysis on artificial intelligence and other machine learning in the forensics discipline. We need more social science research on what works to attract, recruit, mm -hmm. and retain the forensics workforce. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about NIJ's recent efforts to support the field of death investigations, including your collaborations with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention? We're currently working with CDC to update our 2011 death investigation guide, which is a huge resource for the field, but definitely demands updating with the current knowledge. Um, we're also working with them on issues around data. It's very important that we have better information about um, data uh, infrastructure, data standardization, data automation, and data sharing so that data in the forensics discipline can be shared across medical examiner's officers, mm -hmm. coroner's officers, public crime labs, and the forensics science community. Wonderful. Well, again, congratulations on your new role and thank you so much for your time today. Thanks. It's been my pleasure. Our thanks to Director Levine for her time. That does it for day one here at the 75th anniversary conference of AAFS. We hope you've enjoyed this trip down memory lane as we've taken a look back at all of your accomplishments over the last 75 years. If you missed any part, remember you can always catch up by finding the latest AAFS TV episodes on our dedicated spot on the AAFS website homepage, on in-house channel 137 here at Shingle Creek Resort, and you can always see all our interviews and clips on our YouTube and Twitter pages. Thanks for joining us here today. We will see you right back here tomorrow.